Thanks for watching NTD Business. Coming up, another brutal day on the stock market with major indexes tumbling today, the Dow hitting its lowest point this year. And House Republicans showcase their commitment to America plan. This is their promise to the people leading up to the midterms. And the UK's new leaders launch a strategy for growth, including tax cuts and more economic freedom. Will this save the UK's economy? That and much more coming up on NTD Business. Great to have you with us. Don Ma here for NTD Business. Some Americans may have a little more trouble finding work in the near future. And the Federal Reserve's latest interest rate hike could be a contributing factor. According to the Fed's latest projections, unemployment rate could rise from the 3.7% last month to 4.4% next year. Some say it could even reach 5%. That could mean between 1 and 2 million more Americans will be laid off. More information, including monthly job gains, will be available early next month. Besides the job market, the Fed's interest rate hikes also have a direct impact on the housing market. The mortgage rate has risen to a new high not seen since 2008. Is this pushing home buyers out of the housing market? NTD spoke with several real estate brokers to get some on the ground views. Here's the story. We still have multiple offer situations, um, just not the 30, 40, 50 offers craziness from the spring. Boyd Rudy, co-owner of Dwellings, Michigan, says the housing market in Detroit's west suburb is still good. According to Freddie Mac, the U.S. average 30-year fixed mortgage rate reached 6.3% this week. The last time we saw rates above 6% was October of 2008. According to brokers from several cities, the rates have slightly dampened the housing market, but not much. With the interest rate going up, it's taken a lot of the um, the downsizing people, the, the downsizing buyers. You know, they're in great rates on their current homes. Uh, I think they're just kind of sitting and waiting it out to wait for those interest rates to come down a bit more, and then they'll probably get back into the market again. Kirsten Jordan, associate broker with Douglas Elliman Real Estate, says the Manhattan real estate market bottomed out from the onset of the pandemic through September 2020. But since then, the market has picked up and stayed busy through August this year. We're seeing a slower September. It's not as busy this September. I would say we're still seeing solid contracts signed you know in the rest of the country people were consistently getting multiple bids on every single property that they were listing that's not the case here in manhattan it's really a very very price sensitive market here craig hogan with coldwell banker realty specializes in luxury properties in chicago he says wealthy buyers are not insulated from higher interest rates we are seeing price reductions there's a lot more housing stock on the market than than we'd like to see but all in all, I've got to say, the market's good. It's, it's good. It's solid. It's not white hot. What we're seeing right now is a reset in the, in the expectation for that price. I think 2020 gave everybody um, a slightly inflated sense of value because it was just so much in demand. Freddie Mac's quarterly Housing Outlook Pulse survey says 46% of the survey respondents are confident the housing market will remain strong over the next year. That's down five percentage points from the second quarter. Reporting by Angela Moy, NTD News. Meanwhile, a well-known economist is warning that the housing market is in a recession already. And home prices could drop 20% by the middle of next year. That's what chief economist Ian Shepardson told clients at Pantheon Macroeconomics. The median existing home price reached an all-time high in June, according to the National Association of Realtors. But by August, it had dropped nearly 6%. Shepardson said prices could go down even more. This comes as long-term mortgage rates jump, pushing many prospective home buyers out of the market. He said sales are lagging behind mortgage applications, and those continue to fall, which means we could see further declines in prices. But despite the warning, he said the housing market is doing better than it was after the Great Recession over 10 years ago. And Wall Street's main indexes all tumbled today. The Dow fell 486 points, or 1 and 6 tenths of percent. S&P dropped 65 points, or 1 and 7 tenths of percent. NASDAQ lost 199 points, or 1 and 8 tenths of a percent. Today's drop put the S&P 500 at about 3,700 points. Late yesterday, Goldman Sachs said the S&P could drop to 3,600 points by the end of this year. It's a 16% cut from its previous target. 
The Federal Reserve just announced another big rate hike this week, and there could be more to come. One Goldman analyst said a majority of investors think a hard landing is inevitable. And just earlier today, I talked to economist Robert Janetsky about the big drop. And what's behind it? Here's what he said. Robert, great to have you this afternoon. So first off, let me talk to you about the stock market. You know, the Dow fell over 700 points below 30,000 now, which is a new low for the year. So I want to ask what you think about that. Are the markets pricing in possible, a possible recession after Powell's speech on Wednesday? What do you think here? Well, they've, been, they've really been uh, factoring in a recession for some time now. Uh, we have stock prices that are now 23 to 33% below their all-time highs at the beginning of the year. So that is a huge drop. This is a major bear market. And we have two leading indicators that have been very reliable on trying to tell us where the economy is going. One is stock prices, the other are housing activity. And both of those are down very significant. So both of these two indicators are telling us that we have some very difficult economic trends ahead. That is a downturn that's probably greater than almost anyone is looking for. You know, it's a hard situation, but let me ask you, do you feel the Fed is overdoing it? You know, they may be. Uh, I, I really don't know if they're overdoing it or not in terms of the sales of securities. I suspect they might be. If I had anything to do with the Fed, uh, I, my advice to them was always to be cautious with monetary policy. I advised them against pouring money into the economy, which I claimed was going to ignite inflation. All of that occurred. But the Fed also is in a very difficult position right now because Congress itself has created serious problems for the economy, not only now, but really for the next decade. You know, Congress is doing victory laps over all the legislation that they've passed. And this legislation has been spending trillions and trillions of dollars over the next decade in order to try and make things better. Unfortunately, government spending doesn't make things better, it makes things worse. And the reason for that is, when government controls spending, it takes the control away from the private productive sector that allows for the economy to grow. And the private productive sector isn't doing well right now. Ever since they've started passing all this spending legislation, we've had the worst drop in productivity in 75 years, as far back as the day to go. What does that mean? That means living standards are declining. And with all this legislation spending money away from the private sector into government sector, we are likely to see no productivity, no progress in the economy. Right. And Goldman Sachs is slashing you know, S&P 500 index year-end targets to 3,600. Well, welcome, right. welcome to the party. Where the heck do, were you? Do you think it's the beginning yeah, of this think- year? All they did is waited for the market to go down by 16% and then cut their forecast for 16%. That's worthless information. It, uh, it's very disappointing. Uh, they should have just kept quiet <laughs> and not said anything. But do you think now's the time to sell? Uh, you know, any short-term forecast is uh, very difficult, very speculative. Uh, the interesting thing I'm looking at short-term is that both the S&P and the NASDAQ indexes have dropped back to a key support level, which was a low that they hit a couple of months ago. Uh, if it breaks that low from a technical standpoint, that means we could go down a lot further. Uh, the other thing that happens often when you hit a support area, the market will go back up finding that support. So th- this right now is a particularly difficult thing. When I look out long term, I don't see any hope at the moment that conditions are going to get a whole lot better other than maybe a, a re- short term rebound in the market. All right. Thank you very much. Robert Janeski, economist at Classical Principles. Pleasure talking to you today. 
And House Republicans have revealed their vision for America as the November 8th midterm elections draw near. The Commitment to America event happened in Pennsylvania this morning, and NTD Business's very own Paul Graining was there. Take a look. Today in a warehouse deep in America's Rust Belt, House Republicans shared their vision in the run-up to the 2022 midterm elections. What we're going to roll out today is a commitment to America in Washington. Not Washington, D.C., but Washington County, Pennsylvania. In that power to the people spirit, McCarthy revealed his first move should the GOP retake the House in November, scrap a Democrat plan to hire far more taxmen over the next 10 years. Because on our very first bill, we're going to repeal 87,000 IRS agents. Our job is to work for you, not go after you. House GOP Whip Steve Scalise said that 87,000 new agents should be sent to secure the southern border instead. Lawmakers committing to securing the border and stopping deadly fentanyl from entering America. That poison starts in China and comes across our border. Do you realize it's killing 300 Americans every day? It's like an airliner crashing each day. Republicans criticizing the Democrats' catch-and-release border policy. But unsurprisingly, American families suffering under inflation was today's biggest talking point. The Republican plan? Cut government spending and revitalize fossil fuel production to bring down gas prices and manufacturing costs. That's in stark contrast to the Democrats' expensive plans to reduce CO2 emissions. But House Majority Leader Steny Hoyer criticized the GOP plan as short on specifics. Their new platform, which uh, isn't frankly new, as long as slogans are short on details. That's because the true details of Republicans' agenda are too frightening for most American voters. Hoyer didn't elaborate further. Paul Graney, NTD News, Pennsylvania. And the White House is taking steps it hopes will help combat the country's drug problem. Officials today announced nearly $1.5 billion will be used to fight substance abuse. Officials say opioids were responsible for over 100,000 overdose deaths in 2021. And just to put that into perspective for you, that's one death every five minutes. The new funds will go toward treating substance abuse disorders and overdose education efforts. It also makes naloxone more accessible, which is a medication that can reverse overdoses. Currently, there are legal obstacles limiting access to naloxone in some states. President Biden has also announced funding for law enforcement and sanctions on individuals and groups involved with drug cartels. And Democrats introduced a proposal Thursday that would restrict senior government officials, including lawmakers, Supreme Court justices and their families from trading stocks. The plan would strengthen disclosure requirements and increase fines to $1,000 per for every 30-day period that a person is in violation of the rules. Right now, those fines are $200. Lawmakers' ability to trade stocks has been in the subject of increasing scrutiny over the years. Several were scrutinized for their financial transactions during the early days of the pandemic, when members of Congress received briefings that warned of impeding financial crash. Text for their legislation is expected in the next week. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi has committed to putting it to a floor vote. Our next story, adding as many electric vehicles as possible in a short amount of time creates problems for the energy grid. Will it, will it be able to keep up with demand? NTD Char Marshall has more. Replacing traditional gas cars with EVs too quickly could create significant challenges for an electrical grid infrastructure that isn't yet advanced enough to handle a full EV society. One obvious sign of the issue was California's recent alert asking residents to avoid charging their electric vehicles during peak hours. Lack of compliance with the measure meant widespread blackouts due to the additional strain on the electrical grid. We asked Lauren Fix of Car Coach Reports for her analysis. Now, the grid is not one gigantic grid across the entire country. There are segments of grids, and certain areas are hurting more than others. California is one of them because they've shut down nuclear power. They're reduced... Uh, their natural gas, and they don't want coal plants. They want everything to be on wind and solar, but that can only supply up to 18%. We're at about 11 right now, and they're still not at their maximum capacity, but still that's not enough. 
Even using nuclear energy as a crutch, the cost of the necessary upgrades to the grid could be as high as $4 trillion, according to a Woodmac estimate. Without nuclear power, the price tag bumps up another half trillion. EVs also come with hidden extra costs for homeowners. Some may not realize that not having specific up-to-date wiring in their home could come with the risk of fire. You're responsible for putting a charging station in your home. If you have an older home, it's going to cost more. You're going to need a special line drawn for that. A certified electrician must install this. If not, you could find yourself with your home on fire. And this has happened in a lot of areas in older homes because they're not wired properly. So make sure that you have all that available to you before you make a decision. What is the missing piece or pieces to the equation? John Murphy from the Clean Energy Jobs Coalition in New York told the Epic Times, there needs to be a plan, not a ban, on supplemental energies until it's possible to phase them out. Energy expert Jill Tejan told the Epic Times energy storage is absolutely necessary to help the electric grid make the transition to more renewable energy. Murphy concurred that a lack of energy storage is a huge problem. Sean Marshall, NTD News. Turning to the UK, new leadership is in place. So what's their big first policy step? It's significant tax cuts. The UK finance minister announced today. We will cut the basic rate of income tax to 19 pence in April 2023, one year earlier. That means a tax cut for over 31 million people in just a few months' time. This means that we will have one of the most competitive and pro-growth income tax systems in the world. The new measures include keeping the corporate tax at 19 percent, the lowest in the G20. The goal here is to encourage businesses to invest and grow. The previous administration wanted to raise it to 25 percent. And then there's reducing the basic income tax rate from 20 percent to 19 percent. This will give some relief to everyday British people. Then there's also getting rid of the 45 percent tax for people who make over 150,000 pounds, which is equal to $163,000. In other words, cutting taxes for the wealthy. They're also giving large tax cuts to the home purchase tax. They want more home buying. And then there's also getting rid of a cap on bankers' bonuses. Here's the UK finance minister explaining why they're doing this. A strong UK economy has always depended on a strong financial services sector. We need global banks to create jobs here, invest here, and pay taxes here in London, in London, not in Paris, not in Frankfurt, and not in New York. All the bonus cap did was to push up the basic salaries of bankers or drive activity outside Europe. The strategy here is growth, growth, and more growth. When taxes are lower, more businesses crop up, more businesses can expand, and more consumers spend. So, is this a good idea? Torsten Bell doesn't think so. He's the head of the Resolution Foundation, whose mission is to improve lower-income living standards. Bell has a background in economic policy, and he focuses on financial inequality. He doesn't support the cuts, and one problem he sees is the borrowing. We're talking about a very big increase, over £400 billion worth of borrowing, putting the public finances on an unsustainable setting. Well, if you want to do that, the price will be higher interest rates and also a lower value for sterling. There hasn't really been any talk on cutting spending, though. So with less tax revenue, there will have to be more heavy borrowing to pay for all that spending. And it indeed will be very expensive, especially since interest rates are very high. In fact, the UK may need to raise taxes in the future to pay back the borrowed money, including interest. Peter Schiff, the chief economist of Europac, tweeted that cutting taxes was like throwing gasoline on a fire. He he says that the government should have cut spending instead. And the market didn't seem to like it either. The British pound fell and investors sold their UK bonds. Aside from that, how will the plan positively impact the UK economy? We spoke with Daniel Bunn. He's the executive vice president at the Tax Foundation. Bun says that focusing on growth is correct, but it will be growth in the long term. It's unclear when they'll get there, especially with all the unique challenges in the world. Not all tax cuts are created equal. Certainly, if you're going to be loosening fiscal policy, cutting people's taxes, putting more money in people's pockets, uh, that may increase spending and continue to drive inflation. 
However, uh, there are some reforms in this package that are to support investment uh, and to uh, expand, I think, in the government's um, other policies to expand uh, the capacity of the economy that should, over uh, over a number of years, likely be deflationary. People refer to this kind of policy as supply-side economics, focusing on creating more supply. Or as Elon Musk once said, if you don't make stuff, there's no stuff. But critics, usually those left of center, call it trickle-down economics. President Biden says it doesn't work. We spoke with economist and historian Robert Wright to get his opinion. His views are quite similar to Bunn's. In the past, they've implemented such policies and uh, they have worked longer term, um, sometimes short term as well, uh, but sometimes uh, probably most infamously in, in the state of Kansas in the United States, uh, it, it didn't work uh, short term. And just for some brief context, Wright is referring to the deep tax cuts Kansas enacted back in 2012, which really didn't show any compelling economic results. They were even repealed five years later. Wright says that the falling pound and investors ditching bonds are only temporary market movements. It doesn't in any way mean that the policies have failed. The two are likely to rebound as time goes on. And Wright says there's something else the new government has done that will also strongly affect the economy. There's more in the, 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 the proposed mini budget, uh, including lots of things that increase uh, economic freedom. And if there's one thing that we're sure about, countries with higher levels of economic freedom do better in the long term. And the measures that increase economic freedom include a network of investment zones, Businesses in these zones will get to endure less regulation as well as liberalized planning rules and lower taxes. The government also wants to change regulations to make it easier to invest as well as build infrastructure. Wright says that over several decades of analysis, it's clear that countries with more economic freedom do better. Still to come, General Motors stops taking orders for the electric Hummer. It's so popular, they're fully booked. And Yankees fans paying top dollar for outfield seats, hoping to catch a record-breaking home run ball. That and more coming up on NTD Business. Welcome back. General Motors has stopped taking orders for the electric Hummer. The company says reservations are fully booked, with about 45,000 each for the pickup and SUV versions. It's unclear how long it will take to deliver all these vehicles. Less than 400 of the pickups were delivered between January and June. The SUV deliveries are set to start in spring next year. The Hummer EV isn't cheap, though. Depending on the trim, the price is between $84,000 and $104,000. And New York Yankee Aaron Judge is trying to break the team's record for most home runs in a season. And it's causing a boom for the team's ticket sales. The Yankees are in the middle of a four-game series against the Boston Red Sox. Fans who want a chance to catch the record-breaking home run ball are paying top dollar for tickets. StubHub lists the most expensive ticket in the outfield for last night's game at over $1,600. Judge has hit 60 home runs so far this season. The Yankees' current record is 61 home runs, held by Roger Maris. The Yankees beat the Red Sox in the first game of the series 5-4. And shopping experts are advising parents to start thinking about starting their holiday shopping as early as this month. The season's hottest toys could be in short supply and high demand. Entity's Andrew Thomas has the details. At the annual Holiday of Play toy show in New York, some of the hottest toy brands showed off their latest products. Ali Marjeski is editor-in-chief of the Toy Insider, which hosts the fair. So we're looking at a whole slew of trends this year. We're seeing a lot of as-seen-on-screen characters, so that's kids' favorite TV shows, movies, even YouTube personalities, a lot of toys based on that. This is Air Titan's T-Rex. 
the inflatable dinosaur is about the size of an adult and can be driven around by remote control. But consumers who want to save should consider toys from 2021. Supply chain issues in 2021. So we're looking at a lot of that stock came in late. So companies have, or retailers have it on clearance now. Another toy on display is the Magic Mixies Crystal Ball, a spin-off from the Moose Tube Squad YouTube series. But there's still nothing wrong with last year's toys. So now is a really great time to buy some of those hot toys from last year. They're not old, they're just not new for 2022. There's also a growing number of toys aimed at focus and brain training. We're seeing eco-friendly and diversity in a trend we're calling socially responsible, as well as wellness wonders, uh, promoting mental and physical wellness for kids. Overall, Marjeski says shoppers should expect to spend more on their holiday shopping this year, potentially as much as 15% more, as companies and retailers adjust for historic inflation. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. And that's all the stories we have today from the NTD business team and myself, Don Ma. You can follow me on Twitter, too. If you have any news tips or feedback for the show, you can email us at business at NTD.com. That's all for today. Thanks for watching. We'll see you on Monday.